at his own expense with, went with me to Bangladesh because he's been hearing about this from both his mom and dad for a long time and he wanted to see the place. It was a real trip. And what was really thrilling about it was I got to go back to the same little village where I spent a lot of time uh, back then, a place called Goria, way up in the northwest corner of Bangladesh. Um, at that time, it was 200 thatched houses. And I would spend a lot of nights out there. You know, Andrew kept asking me, Dad, where was Mom when you were doing all these? Well, Mom was in the house. You know, back then, women couldn't get out of the house. So my young bride was uh, really, <laughs> really patient with me. While I was living out in the thatched house in Gorea, I lived with a guy named Mr. Buddy, who was the primary school teacher. And his wife was with her family, uh, getting ready to have a baby. So he had an empty, no women in the house. And I could uh, sleep in his big, with him in his big wooden bed, where typically the whole, you know, he and his wife, and it was big enough that they could bring some kids in when they got kids. So we went back, and what was most heartening was that even though people in Bangladesh are still very poor, they are dramatically better off than they were 35 years ago. You know, I went back to the same places, talked to some of the same people a generation later, and the, the houses are better, the roads are better, the kids are visibly better nourished. There are m many, much better variety of foods in the market. Um, the thing that was most um, heartening, it took me about a, a day to figure it out, was I was talking to women. I was talking to Bangladeshi women. You know, I just never, I spoke Bengali 35 years ago, but <clears throat> I almost never talked to a woman because they were in the house. It was inappropriate for them to talk to a man other than their husband or a, somebody close to the family, certainly not a foreign man. But uh, over those years, you know, a Grameen Bank and lots of NGOs have built up um, women's self-help groups, the microcredit groups, extension groups, many of them for landless women. They've all elected officers, and so a whole generation of women have come up with leadership abilities, and so I was talking to these low-income Bangladeshi women who, through an interpreter, were able to speak and speak with dignity. Really, you know, the, the prime minister of Bangladesh is a woman, which was unthinkable. And something like this has happened worldwide over the last generation. In the last 25 years or so, the number of people in absolute poverty in the world has been cut in half. So if, if you're the age of most Wheaton students, the world has made more progress against poverty in your lifetime than ever before in human history. I think this is God, that this is God moving in our time. This is, to me, this is the great exodus of our time. You know, God answering prayers. My friends, uh, mostly these are Muslim men. I, got, I went back to Gorea and I found Mr. Body. I, I had a hard time finding anything because it's now a kind of a pretty big rural commercial center. And I, uh, there was a lady, maybe 35 years old, who said, oh, I, Mr. Body was my teacher. And so she knew where he lived. And she pointed us, so we, our van drove over that way. And I saw Mr. Body walking along the road. So I, I jumped out of the van. He recognized me immediately. He took me by the hand. We walked hand in hand back to his house, the same place. But now it's a paka house. You know, it's been built up. It's no longer thatch. Um, and within five minutes, there were half a dozen men there that I used to drink tea with 35 years ago. All of them talked about how their lives are better, um, much better than they ever expected. Mr. Body particularly emphasized the fact that the gully next to the house where the mosquitoes used to, bre to breed has been filled in. So he doesn't have such a big problem with mosquitoes. Um, these are Muslim men, and they... They thank Allah. Um, we have a different name. And Allah, 
There are real differences between Islam and Christianity, but what they get is who they should be thanking. They understand that they should be thanking God, that something wonderful has happened around them. And there's also been great progress against poverty in Ethiopia, Ghana. In the last 10 years, Brazil has made dramatic progress against hunger and poverty. The UK has reduced child poverty. So all over the world, we have seen changes for the better for people who surely have been praying to God. Most poor people are religious. And they have been praying to God. And God then gives them a chance to feed their kids and maybe send their kids to school. And I think God is calling us. We can see the whole picture. We can see what is happening worldwide. This is our loving God calling us to get with the program, to be part of this great exodus, to help to lead this great exodus from hunger that has been happening and can continue to happen. It's very clear that we know a lot about how to reduce poverty and hunger, and more of this can happen. Now, in our own richly blessed country, we have also been able to make progress against poverty when we really tried. The, the last great uh, improvement for poor people in America was before many of you were born. It was in the 60s and the early 70s, but this is not a different country. And in the 60s and early 70s, we had a period of sustained economic growth. That's really crucial, so people can have jobs. And then we made an effort. President Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty. President Richard Nixon, in fact, was he really increased some of the assistance programs that we now take for granted. So it was food stamps were increased under Nixon. WIC was really created and expanded under Nixon. So there was a period there where the, in which the whole country really wanted to reduce poverty. I think partly because of the race riots of the late 60s in this country. You know, it sort of caught people. And so the whole country said, we got to do something about poverty in our midst. And in those years, the 60s and the early 70s, we cut the percentage of Americans below the poverty line in half. Then again, in the early Clinton years, that was a shorter period of time, but again, the economy was really good. There were some good policy decisions by the President and Congress. And during those period, that period of time, we cut the poverty rate by a third. Now, we haven't sustained the progress against poverty. At other times over the last 40 years, we've been distracted. We had other things that were important to us. We had very, we've had gone through various paroxysms of budget cutting, cut these programs. We've done that a lot of times. Um, you know, sometime we had, a, we had a chance at the end of the Cold War, we could have used those resources to really invest in our people. We didn't. We, get, we, we had a big tax cut. So we haven't sustained a, an interest, a, a commitment to reducing poverty and hunger. And so as a result, even before the recession that we're now still coming out of, the rate of poverty in America was about the same as it was in 1974. I think um, you can explain it lots of ways, but I think the main way to explain it is that we haven't, as a nation, made it a priority. You can just look at, while I was writing the book, I, was, I got to be at home and actually do some quiet thinking, and I made a list of our presidents. And we haven't had a president since Lyndon Johnson who made reducing poverty in America one of his top five priorities. So. Why are we surprised that we haven't reduced poverty? We've elected these people, they're good people, but it hasn't been a top five priority for a long time. We have never had a US president 
who made reducing hunger and poverty in the world one of his top 20 priorities. In the UK, for both, the, the, both Labour and uh, Conservative Prime Ministers now, reducing poverty in the world is one of their top 20 priorities because English and Scottish voters want it to be a priority. So David Cameron, the current Prime Minister of the UK, is a very conservative guy. He's cut lots of other programs, but he is expanding his International Development Assistance Program because voters want that to happen. They think it's the right thing to happen. This sort of moves me to my next, the next topic, and that is the connection between grace and advocacy. I wonder what is wrong with us religiously? What is wrong with our country religiously? 95% of Americans believe in God. One in four Americans are in church every Sunday morning. But we haven't elected a president since Lyndon Johnson who made reducing poverty a priority for the nation. It's not that I think that the federal government can do everything, but if the federal government is AWOL, food banks and state governments can't make up the difference. You've got to have a framework in place that really encourages state governments, communities, and uh, community organizations to do their part. So how can this be that uh, a nation that is in many ways, certain, not a Christian, you know, there are a lot of non-Christians, but there are a lot of Christians in this country. Where are we? that we don't insist that our country should get serious about reducing poverty in our country and around the world. My thinking about this was um, influenced uh, quite a bit by a book called Grace at the Table by uh, Robert Putnam and David Campbell. David Campbell's at Northwestern. Uh, these are sociologists, and I'm embarrassed that it took us the two sociologists uh, to wake up a Lutheran pastor. But um, they, they, they show a lot of data on how Americans believe and behave, based mainly on telephone surveys, talking to people over decades about how we believe and behave. One thing they found is that a lot of the differences among us in belief don't make much practical difference. They don't change our behaviors at all. Um, church attendance changes behavior. Prayer changes behavior, what we do. But one, dot, one religious experience very much changes behavior. And that is that those of us who experience God as a loving presence in our lives are much more likely to trust other people. I think because we experience God trusts us, you know. <laughs> we screw up five, six, you know, 15, 20 times a day and God still loves us and forgives us and so we're willing to give other people a break. And also people who experience God as a loving presence in our lives are much more inclined to support an active role for the government in helping poor people in our country and around the world. So they would be much more, we would be much more inclined to support the WIC program for undernourished kids in our own country or uh, develop international development assistance programs than people who experience God as harsh or remote. I, that just knocked me off. I was so amazed by it. I was struck at the importance of that finding. In fact, I, uh, I managed to get David Campbell on email one Sunday afternoon, and I said, I'm, you know, I'm going to give a speech, and I want to make sure that I got this straight. Um, so, uh, and Robert Putnam was on leave and was apparently un out of touch with anybody, but as the conversation by email kept going, he was evidently had his on blind, you know, BCC. So all of a sudden, Robert Putnam was part of the conversation, and they got out their, you know, their data tables and said, yeah, I got this right. Um, that the experience that Christians have, the core experience of God as loving and gracious and merciful, that, that frees people, moves people to push for justice. 
I was really thrilled to find that out. And to me, it just makes a lot of sense. So as I try to figure out, you know, how are we going to change our politics so that the nation uh, cares as a nation, that we care more about poor people, I've come to think that, that evangelism is really fundamental. Putnam and Campbell also show that a lot of people who go to church every Sunday don't experience God as a loving presence in their lives. That's also true in conservative evangelical churches. So the cross is right there. But they experience, well, I'm here, but I really don't know if I belong, and God is strict, and they don't experience God as loving. Um, so I've come, and then there are a lot of people who, who especially now, the fastest growing religious group in the country are people who don't have, uh, identify with any church anymore, uh, especially young people. A lot of people are dropping out of religion, and to some extent, they're turned off by the churches. And what's amazing, what's, I didn't know this, but a lot of those people experience God as a loving presence in their lives. So they're alienated from the church, but they don't feel alienated from God. I'm not saying that's ideal, but that's what they say. So what I think, and I here at Wheaton, above all, you know, this place especially, I'm looking for you, to you, to help us figure this out. How do we proclaim and uh, act out the love of God that we experience in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ in a fresh and compelling way, in a holistic way, that will move lots of people to say, I want my church and I want my country to do a better job of providing help and opportunity to people who are struggling. How do we make that happen? How, how, do, we, how do we articulate the gospel in a way that um, also moves people to want to change the world for God? Because surely God's, God, God doesn't just love us one by one. God loves the world. And God has purposes for us in the world. It's in your, your motto of for Christ and, and for his kingdom. So how can we proclaim and live the gospel in a way that moves the nation? I think we need a spiritual movement in our country. Um, I'm not sure how many people have to be moved by the spirit to change the nation. Maybe not that many. You know, maybe 10, 20,000 people. If 10 or 20,000 people would be moved by the love of God that we experience, newly moved by God's grace in Jesus Christ, to want to reach out and change the world for hungry people, I think that might be enough to get our country to take action, serious action, to make it possible for people to earn a living in this country and feed their kids, and also because we're the most powerful country in the world, U.S. action to encourage progress against poverty around the world would also make a huge difference. So uh, I hope you're going to figure that out and also live it out, because uh, it's just so clear we need it, and in fact, if if ten or if if five thousand people would live that gospel, I think it would be attractive to a lot of the people who are now turned off from the churches. That a lot of people who are now staying home on Sunday morning would say, "I want to be part of a Christian community." You know, I think if we were serious about justice, I think we would also make the gospel of God's love, our, the evangelism, much more compelling to a lot of people who don't find Christianity very compelling now. I'm looking forward to talking to you about this when we do the questions. Uh, let me now talk about uh, Bread for the World. Um, 
Bread for the World is a collective Christian voice for uh, uh, a collective Christian voice urging our nation's decision makers to end hunger at home and abroad. Uh, we're a bipartisan organization that's real. Uh, members of both party, con members of Congress from both parties are on my board. Bob Dole is on, he's been on the board a long time and in fact he gives us a lot of money which is really heartening. Um, so I think the best way for me to give you an insight into how Bread for the World works is to tell you about a friend named Pat Pelham. She uh, lives in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, she was part, she played a key role in the Jubilee Debt Relief Campaign of the year 2000, which was a tremendous demonstration of the power of the gospel in politics. Um, in, I think it was in 1998, both Archbishop Tutu and the Pope said we ought to use the millennium year 2000 as a time when we could have a jubilee for poor countries that have impossible debts. Because starting in the 70s, Africa, a lot of other poor countries had accumulated massive debts, unpayable debts. You know, if these were debts in the US, they'd go to bankruptcy court, but there are no bankruptcy courts internationally. So a country like Mozambique was paying more to, to the US and the UK and other, other, cre other creditors every year to service those old debts than it was spending on all health and education expenses for all its people. It just wasn't right. It needed to be fixed. But how do you fix a thing like that? And it started with a key Protestant and a key Catholic leader. And the idea of 2000 as a jubilee just hit a lot of Christian people as right. You know, if they'd read the Bible, they knew what jubilee was. This seemed like, yeah, you know, the idea of jubilee was every 50 years of impossible debts, you write them all off every 50 years and start over so that people aren't hobbled. So um, in 1999, uh, Bread for the World really started to campaign. Uh, together with Christian groups in Europe and and also there were Jubilee campaigners in Zambia and other places. In Zambia they were campaigning to say, you know, we need to reduce corruption so that if we get our debts released or reduced, we can actually use those resources better. Um, when we started on it, um, I noticed that uh, the representative from Birmingham, Alabama, Spencer Backus, was chair of the International Subcommittee of the Banking Committee. And I had met Spencer Backus in Birmingham because we've got a good, strong Bread for the World group, leadership group in Birmingham. And um, they had organized a hunger banquet and they'd invited the member of Congress to come. So they positioned Mr. Backus between me and the chair of the Republican Party of the district. <laughs> who was also the Presbyterian Hunger Action Enabler for Birmingham. So, in fact, uh, Mr. Backus uh, sponsored uh, um, a nutrition program bill that year. Uh, so then when I saw he was the chair of the relevant subcommittee, I could see we're not going to get the U.S. to participate in writing down the debts of the poorest countries or some of the poorest countries if if his committee is not part of it. So I called Pat and her fr friend Elaine Van Cleve. Um, and um, they, within two weeks, uh, came with two other people. They flew up at their own expense to meet Mr. Backus. Uh, they brought letters. They go to Independent Presbyterian Church, which is a pretty conservative, affluent Presbyterian church. But they brought uh, letters to Mr. Backus that had been written at Our Lady of Sorrows Catholic Church across town. And we, we met with, he had just been made chair, and so we met his, the office furniture wasn't even there yet. We sat sort of on desks. And I think Elaine convinced him in her first comments. He said, well, let's just say I don't know anything about this. Tell me what, in fact, he didn't know anything about it. He had no clue. He now admits he's... He now admits he had no idea what they were talking about. 
when he was assigned to this committee, he thought, oh my God, nobody cares about this stuff. Uh, but Elaine said, look, I know that tens of thousands of children die needlessly every day in developing countries, and I think this could help. So I want you to help make, help achieve some debt reduction for some of the poorest uh, countries in the world. And I think he got it right away. He, he's a Southern Baptist, really a decent guy um, in lots of ways. And I think he just got it. And he said, well, I'm going to meet with the Secretary of Treasury this afternoon. I'm going to ask him about this, you know. <laughs> so, so he did. And in fact, Spencer Backus became the most effective advocate uh, for debt relief in the U.S. Congress because he was such an unlikely advocate. And the folks back in Birmingham, the Bread for the World folks, they really organized. It wasn't just one meeting. They went to the Birmingham News. And when Bacchus did something good on this, they got the Birmingham News to editorialize that he was doing the right thing. And they went to Sanford University, and they, we, they held an event, this was like two years later, to give him an award with local community and press people there, give him an award for what he had done on debt relief. And they recruited other churches. So by, by the, as this thing, over a course of two or three years, there were 20 or 25 churches in Birmingham writing letters to Mr. Bacchus thanking him for his leadership. Um, I, I <laughs> he's a, he really is a character. He, um, on the, when the, the full banking committee considered debt relief for poor countries, um, he, said, he said, you know, I think if we don't write off the debts of some of these, these countries, these people are going to be suffering for the rest of their lives. And I think we're going to be suffering for a lot longer than that. <laughs> um, he also, he also in, on that, in that same uh, intervention, he said, you know, I, I have never read much by Catholics, but uh, I read this, uh, this one um, paper that came out of the Vatican. And he said, who could disagree with this? This is the right thing to do. So anyway, Spencer Backus, we had to push for two years on that. It was maybe the biggest social justice change that the churches had achieved since the civil rights movement. Um, at the end, uh, uh, it was the end of President Clinton's term, and at the bill signing, he invited me to come and introduce, introduce the president at the bill signing in recognition of what, not just what Pat and Elaine had done, but what Bread for the World people all over the country in districts and states all over the country had done to push over two years to get that measure through the U.S. Congress. And uh, the president used his, he, he talked about Spencer back as he said, you know, you're from the other party, but if, if you hadn't provided leadership on this, we wouldn't be here. And I used my two minutes to talk about Pat and Elaine. It started, actually, Pat's involvement in Bread for the World started because her pastor counseled her to get involved in this. She had been going for a walk, I think, like in 1996, and suddenly felt like God was asking her to do something for Africa. And she had no idea what to do. She had small kids. What was she going to do? But her pastor said, well, why don't you get invo involved in Bread for the World? You don't have to go to Africa to help in Africa. And what's striking to me is that debt relief preceded many African countries, other poor countries, had their debts reduced. By all accounts, the money was used well. It was a massive expansion of education in Africa. There are 30 million more African kids in school at the end of the decade than were at the, in school in the year 2000 improvements in health care in many countries. And I don't think any of that would have happened if Pat Pelham hadn't been responsive to her prayer and then together with a lot of other church people from different denominations pushed from Birmingham, Alabama to make it happen. That's how Bread for the World works. I want to tell you a little bit more about the work that we did in 2011 and what we're doing in 2012. I think what we achieved in 2011 is the biggest social justice victory for Christians since the Jubilee Movement, maybe bigger than the Jubilee Movement. Uh, we, 
because at the beginning of 2011, the, there were deep, uncompromising, huge pressures to cut programs for poor people indiscriminately. So I think I mentioned this morning that the House of Representatives passed a budget that proposed to cut $4 trillion in government spending with two-thirds of those cuts coming from programs focused on poor people, mainly Medicaid and SNAP, the food stamp program. Why should poor people give up two-thirds of what needs to be given up to balance the, federal, the, the, fis the fiscal deficit? It doesn't make sense. And then they, they right away passed an appropriations bill that cut WIC and would have thrown 14 million people off food aid rations in refugee camps all over the world. And so we work in a bipartisan way, but this was just wrong. And the Democrats really weren't helping that much because the Democrats talked about the middle class, about Medicare. They have been very carefully counseled by their political consultants that if they talk about poverty in this country, Mo they will lose elections. So listen, Democrats don't talk much about poverty, and neither do Republicans. So it was really church leaders who, uh, and church people who decided we had to do something, and so we started with a long fast. It was Jim Wallace and Tony Hall and myself at first. I, f I went for a week without food. It was a real fast, asking God to... Uh, be more present in my own life, more present in the life of the nation, and then also a public fast, asking the nation to contact, to fast with us, pray with us, and write to Congress to form a circle of protection around programs focused on poor and hungry people. We can reduce the fiscal deficit. We can make our budget work without being tough on people who can't feed their kids. Um, it was a a uh, long saga, lots, couple things broke our way. You know, it felt, sometimes it felt like, you know, wow, this is the Red Sea parting here. This is great. <laughs> uh, and what's amazing is that a year later, there have been no significant, no substantial cuts to programs focused on poor and hungry people in our own country or around the world. You know, this was done by Christian people across the country contacting their own members of Congress about forming a circle of protection. Neither party was with us, and um, in the end, we got what we asked for. We, in the end, we also reached out to Jews and Muslims and secular groups, because Christians aren't the only people who care about poor people. Uh, and so the, the coalition grew, but we really started as a coalition of uh, Christian groups. It's another demonstration that Christian people. It doesn't happen just because somebody in Washington does something. It has to be Christian people at the grassroots writing to Senator Durbin, writing to Senator Kirk, writing to your member of the House. Actually, Senator Durbin was probably the most important hero for poor people in the budget debate last year, and you should know that. Um, now this year, we've, the fight is not over. We have to protect programs focused on poor people in, in an even more constrained fiscal environment because the President and Congress agreed to cut $2 trillion in government spending over 10 years. The, the part of that comes from the annually appropriated programs. So the President just sent his budget over to Congress and he proposed uh, in fact, a uh, trillion dollars in, no, I misspoke. He proposed deep cuts in the equivalent of a trillion dollars over 10 years in, in the annually appropriated programs. So for, it, the appropriations battles are gonna be uh, very difficult, I think, especially international development assistance. This is things like help to farmers in Africa, nutrition assistance, helping countries use nutrition assistance dollars well. Uh, helping girls get into school in poor countries, those things. All of those expenses are on the block. President Obama in his budget cuts those programs by 5.5%. And that is the high water mark. All over the course of the year, I, we think that the House is going to move pretty quickly on the appropriations process. They will try to raid those international development programs to meet domestic needs that they want to meet. 
Um, and they're not going to be trying to put the money into WIC and um, those kinds of programs. It'll be programs for uh, middle class people or above. So uh, the, the appropriations process, we need help in, in expanding the circle of protection this year to protect those programs. Um, then also the farm bill is going to start, they're going to start work on the farm bill this year. And um, there's already a, 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 a preliminary agreement between the, the top Republicans and Democrats in the agriculture committees in both the House and the Senate. They're going to do some good things, some things we want them to do in farm policy. But they've also agreed they're going to cut food stamps by $5 billion in the farm bill. That's equivalent to a year's worth of all the food charity in the country. All the, all the food that all the churches and food banks in the country collect comes to about $5 billion. And they're, they just say, well, you know, we've got to make this balance, so <laughs> let's cut $5 billion from food stamps. We've got to disabuse them of the notion that it's a good idea to, 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 to protect farm programs, some of which go to very wealthy people, at the expense of people who are using food stamps to keep their kids eating. And then also in the Farm Bill, there's a chance to make food aid more effective. Um, food aid is not very effective. And in fact, there are ways you could reform it that would get a lot more bang for the tax dollars that we're putting into food aid. So we need to protect food aid, but also reform it in ways that it'll, so it'll work better. Um, at the end of the year, after the elections then, a lot of the decisions that will have been made step by step in one house or the other over the course of the year will all come together. And right after the election, there will be a huge decision about the future of our nation and the world. What our tax policies are going to be, what gets cut, who gets cut. And so in 2012, and leading into that end of the year clash, we're arguing that Christian people should speak up for protecting, helping poor people in the middle of a, of a, budget, um, a budget debate. We're also working this year on foreign assistance reform, which I just want to add that because it's not that we always want more money. In our whole foreign assistance program, we've been campaigning now uh, since before the Obama administration, asking Christian people across the country to write to their members of Congress, pushing for better coordination of government agencies, more listening to local people, more transparency, better evaluation, just good business. Uh, in fact, you know, the U.S. government has something like 25 different agencies that run foreign aid programs. So to get better coordination, some consolidation of those programs would just use the money better so that we could do more real good for poor people. And I think, in fact, uh, we've been able to, to push the Obama administration to move in that direction in a good way. They didn't really want to do it at the beginning, but they, they have done those things. And this year, we're hoping that we're able to get bipartisan legislation that gives some of those reforms the force and dur durability of bipartisan law. So that's bread for the world. And I, let me just propose, I'll quit, but I want to ask you to do four things. Three of them bread for the world. So one thing for bread for the world, I hope you'll join bread for the world. Uh, as you leave, there's a, where's the sign up sheet going to be? Can somebody help me? Out here. So right outside, right outside the door is a sign up sheet. If you want to do it that way, you can give us information on yourself, and we'll send you some more information about bread for the world or you can just go to bread.org and sign up as a member. If you become a member of Bread for the World, you'll know more about these things. And if, even if just two or three times a year, you write a letter to your member of Congress, you know, write to Durbin and thank him for the work he's done for poor people. Or write to Mark Kirk when he's out of the hospital and thank him. He's a good advocate for uh, international development assistance. So he needs to hear that people back home appreciate that. Become a member of Bread for the World. Um, the second thing is, in fact, to, to write those letters to Durbin and to, uh, what's the name of your congressman? Rabscamp? Ra help me. Huh? Roscom. He, he doesn't vote with us very often. Ask him to form a circle of protection around poor and hungry people. 
So join bread, write a letter to write letters to your members of Congress. The third thing is to to help us form a bread for the world club here at Wheaton. Uh, this morning, when we when we met with President Riken, he thought that would be a really helpful idea. My understanding is that a number of students, quite a number of students, have expressed interest in being part of a Bread for the World Club. That would provide leadership then. You'd think about events at Wheaton where you could present some of these issues to people one by one and invite them to write letters to Congress or invite Senator Durbin to come here or invite Mr. Roskam to come here and ask him questions about issues that you consider important moral issues. So a Bread for the World group would be uh, great, and Dean Montgomery has uh, agreed to, to uh, be, I don't know what the right technical term is, but to be a sponsor for that kind of group. So if, you, uh, if you're interested in being part of a Bread for the World group, uh, be sure to talk to Dean Montgomery. So those are the three things for Bread. Join, write letters, provide a leadership group. And then the fourth thing, which is not Bread for the World, is take these elections this year very seriously. Um, vote for sure. It's also important, Bread for the World doesn't do it, but pick a good candidate, somebody who cares about the things that you think are important to God, and uh, give him time, give him money, so that we uh, get people into office who, who represent our values. Thanks a lot, let me, let me quit there and we'll have some questions. go up with David, but there is a microphone here, and we'll put that one over there. So if you have some oh. questions, please uh, come to the microphones. David's given us a lot of information tonight um, and some suggestions about the ways that we can respond practically as citizens of this particular country. Um, any questions that you have regarding this or why we should? What's a, what's a good uh, reason for doing this? Whatever you have. Hi, Reverend Beckman. Thank you so much for being with us this weekend. Um, my name is Wendy, and I was a hunger intern in Bethlehem in Palestine this past summer and fall. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, give us some insight on um, what you think our role, many of us as, um, especially in a global sense, especially wealthy, what? sorry? Yeah. Oh, in a global sense as, many of us as white, wealthy, powerful people. Um, what is our role in giving up that power? Um, because I think um, I heard a lot about, I think, talking about the poor as a separate group and us as kind of reaching out to the poor instead of just in our communities and also trying to bring the poor to some kind of status that we have when I think that in a lot of ways, God definitely, at least I think, <laughs> our levels of consumption and our lifestyles are not Christ-like. And so what, what do you think, how does that play into um, responding to God's call to um, be like him and show him to the world? It's a, really, it's a really good point. You're right, and I did sound sort of paternalistic, but it, um, so you're absolutely right that um, it's important for us to um, share power. Um, and you're also right that we are powerful. So um, I think the, the most common sin is that we don't even acknowledge that we're powerful and we don't do anything. So we don't use our power to change things. You know, when we make it possible for little kids, all little kids, to eat properly, that's empowerment. Those children will be better able to take care of themselves their whole lives if they eat all the time when they're little. And there are other ways, um, you know, beyond uh, economic ways, there are some ways to share power. Um, both internationally and in our own country. You know, in our own country, there are issues like 
making it relatively easy for working people to vote. That's an empowerment issue. Bread for the World isn't working on that issue, but it's, it's important because if uh, they can get to the polls and vote, they have um, a better chance to pick somebody who's going to, by, by their own lights, will be responsive to them. And um, I think also there are ways in our, what we're trying to do on foreign assistance reform, partly what we're trying to do is change it so that more of the money that is available to spend, say, in Tanzania can be spent in ways that are responsive to what the Tanzanian government and civil society groups in Tanzania want and not necessarily what the One Campaign or Bread for the World or Save the Children or Cargill or somebody wants. So it's a, you, have, you made a really good point. I appreciate it. Hi, um, I'm studying sociology and community art here. And in my sociology classes, um, we've been discussing how um, class lines are starting to grow even more instead of shrinking. And so um, I was just wondering, like, if we do, let's say, we write to our political leaders um, and they start implementing these changes and they start sending more money to the poor, um, I was just wondering, couldn't this have negative effects on this phenomenon of the growing class lines? Um, because I was just wondering, like, how do you suppose our government and um, us can help the poor help themselves and prevent things like um, growing class lines and, uh, you know, just really like inhibiting the, um, you know, their social mobility? Yeah. Well, first, I mean, it just is not, the, the government sends a lot of money to middle class people. Um, my, my mother-in-law and my stepmother both get social security checks. They do not need those social security checks, but they get them all the time. And they're getting much, much more out of social security than they ever put in. Um, the, the tax deduction for mortgage interest payments is a kind of subsidy for housing, and it goes much, much more. Much of that, much of the money, the loss to the treasury, comes from that, that benefits middle and especially higher income people and, and not low income people. So I just, it's not that, um, you know, we're sending a lot of money to the poor and I'm trying to send more money to the poor. We don't give very much money to the poor. It, uh, much more of the federal budget benefits all other kinds of interests. The other point about making it possible for poor people to earn a living is a really, that's, that's really important. In, in developing countries, the social programs are really weak, and so that's really not so much of an issue. You know, what, what we're trying to do in developing countries is just, you know, scratch a dirt road to the farm so that the, you know, that a poor farmer can buy fertilizer and, and market or crops. In this country, the social programs are more developed, but still what's most important is exactly what you say, um, making it possible for poor people to earn a living. One way to do that is the social programs. For example, you know, investment in health and nutrition and education for all our people will allow people to be more productive workers in a global globally competitive market. I think education is something I didn't mention because it's, we work on federal policy and it's mostly decided at the, at the state and local level. But um, it is the empower, I think a major empowerment issue for low income people in this country is making schools work for low income kids. Um, you know, if, and then the other, the other thing is uh, another way to deal with uh, opportunity for poor people is, is uh, reducing unemployment. Anybody would rather have a job than access to food stamps. So, um, you know, if I were, I think we ought to be pushing our government, in fact, to tilt in the direction of taking action to reduce unemployment. Um, I think we can deal with the deficit in 
you know, I understand the concern about the deficit. I'm concerned too, and I appreciate the people who are pushing on that issue. But I think in the short term, the government can do things to open up job opportunities for poor people. That would be much more powerful than uh, social safety net programs. Doesn't anybody have an easy question? What's wrong? <laughs> I don't know if it's easy, but I have a question. Um, and thanks for all your comments tonight. They've been very interesting and, and helpful. When, when we talk about um, the concern of some of the domestic um, safety net programs being cut and reduced, you know, it's a very real concern. I wonder to what extent Bread for the World or maybe other organizations also take a look at, at just how effective the dollars are being used, let's say, domestically with some of these social programs. We hear about, we hear about the physicians who scam you know, Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And um, is there somebody at, you know, kind of in parallel to what organizations like yours does also saying how can we get the most service for the community and for the world out of the money that people give and the government gives? Yeah. No, it's not another, it's not an easy question. The <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really important point. I mean, Bread for the World is a relatively small organization. So um, we have to pick our shots, you know, focus on a few things and get some things done. Where we've done a lot of work on reform, a lot of work, is on foreign assistance because there aren't other groups that are, you know, there aren't that many other groups that are in a position to do that. And we've pushed to increase the funding for the international development assistance programs, but we can see that you could use those dollars in ways that would be more effective, mainly by, by better consolidation of what the U.S. government's doing, more transparency, better evaluation, and more listening to local people, the empowerment point. You know, do what local people say is important to them. Um, so on that, we've done a lot of work. And it's been interesting. I mean, it's striking that for politicians of either party, it's much easier for them to say, we're going to put a billion dollars into X, some new thing, than to go back to where a billion dollars is spent year after year and say, how are we going to get an extra hundred million dollars out of value out of that billion dollars. You know, it's just not attractive to politicians to do the nitty gritty of, of program reform, program management. Uh, foreign assistance is one on which we've done a lot. We also, because we've done a lot of work on the nutrition programs, SNAP and WIC, we've worked hard on making those programs more effective. Food stamps used to waste a lot of money. There were all these stories about, I mean, everybody knows the story about somebody in line who was using food stamps to buy booze or, um, or people sell in there. There used to be little coupons, so people could sell those pretty easily for drugs or something. But the, both the Clinton and Bush administrations really worked hard, and we helped them work hard to tighten up the food stamp program. It's now a debit card, so it's a centralized, computerized network. So when somebody purchases something, we know that's food. You know it because you can see what was purchased, you know, from the grocery code. Um, and it's hard to sell a card because you can't see how much value is on it. So the error rate for the, the error rate for food stamps now is very, very low. And if there's some cheating going on, it's mostly um, local convenience stores. The stores are, are cheating, but very few beneficiaries now um, do that. And similarly with WIC, we've worked to update the, the package of, of food that is available because when the WIC program was designed, we had different ideas of what was good to feed a baby. So, you know, you, it was a lot of infant formula and stuff like that. And that was hard to change because the infant formula companies <laughs> didn't want to change the package of which were the foods that were subsidized for people with low-income babies. But maybe two years ago, um, USDA helped to, uh, we, we pushed and encouraged and USDA in fact reformed the WIC program. So on those issues we have played a role. We haven't done much on the, we, we don't haven't done anything on the medical programs. And you're right that I think in Medicaid and Medicare there are abuses. My sense is also in job training programs there's an opportunity to get more bang for the buck. 
And we as citizens, should we really encourage that kind of approach? What we've said to the people who want to cut these programs is great. If you can show us ways to make them more efficient, we'll help you do it. Uh, but we shouldn't cut back on our level of effort. Or, you know, if we can make, like we love the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. Those are approaches that reward work. You have to work and have a paycheck to, to get, in effect, it's a negative income tax. Uh, so people who are poor or near poor but are working and still can't feed their kids can get the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. That's an approach we support because we think it, you know, it, it sets the right incentives. So I, I agree with your point. Take one more question. Yeah, um, I know you mentioned it um, a little bit, but could you just um, explain a little bit of what Bread for the World does to address some of the root issues of hunger, both here and abroad? I know you mentioned a little bit about unemployment and international development, um, but in what ways do you feel like it's not just um, looking at the symptoms and is trying to help the real core issues that might be underlying? So, like, what are the root causes in your mind? Um, I guess I guess I'm asking you that too, but mm -hmm. you know, with the uh, dependency problem on um, on international aid of these developing countries, and also in the U.S., um, seeing poverty at times perhaps being perpetuated because they can rely on uh, food stamps, and you know, so we're. The reason why we want to feed people is for them to have a better life, not just so that we know that they're fed. Um, so, right. yeah, I don't know. So on uh, the on the dependency issue, I guess I. It's there's a real issue there, but I think it's exaggerated. It's a, used as a pretext for not being generous. Um, so, for example. Three years ago, I got to go to Mozambique. Mozambique has, uh, is getting a lot of international assistance, because, but it's because the government is using resources well. It's a democratically elected government. They've managed to make a transition from a long, long civil war, so they have peace. Um, it's a pretty good government. Now, they, there's, they're getting a lot of foreign aid, so if there's a country that would be corrupted by dependence, Mozambique would be um, a candidate for that, for that uh, risk. But my sense is that, in fact, they, you know, they're, they're, they're poor, and they are using the opportunity of the aid that they're giving, get it, getting to, to uh, manage their economy well, to people work hard. It's not like there's a rich class in the cities that's living high on the hog. Um, so I think, I guess I, I think the issue of dependency and making negative incentives is, um, an, is a real concern, but I don't see it happening, um, I don't see it happening in developing countries that I know. And then in this country too, um, it's a real issue. You wanted to, we, you know, one reason we like the tax credits is because they help make the incentives right. Um, but food stamps, you don't get much money from food stamps. You've got to be extremely poor. You've got to have virtually no assets and no income, and, um, and then you don't get very much money. It's not enough money to buy groceries for a month. I mean, you get it for the month, but it, it lasts you through about 22 days. So who's going to give up a job for that food card? Not very many people. So the poor people I know are not, um, they are scrambling. They are scrambling to to uh, to make you know to make to get out of poverty to deal with it. So now you know I'm sure that dependence is a problem in some instances, but I I don't see that as as big a problem as it is in our rhetoric. Maybe I can just if I may just um, I want to close with a story. And I I told you about one of my boys this morning, so I want to tell you about my other boy um, and. Uh, he, he's had a really tough time. My second son um, is, uh, has really suffered from uh, alcoholism and addiction. 
uh, more than we knew, but you know, it became clear that he was uh, deeply addicted to both alcohol and drugs. And um, so he, and his addiction, addi addiction is, ad I am just, it is real clear to me now that this is a disease. It's a problem of the frontal cortex and it's a genetically inherited disease. So, you know, I can have a couple of glasses of wine and stop. John can't. Um, and it's related, it's, there's a high correlation with other diseases of the frontal cortex, things like bipolar disorder and um, ADD. And John's got his share of both of those. So, um, his, uh, on the other hand, I'm not excuse, he's got a, he's got a tick, he's got a not drink and not drug. He, uh, but his addiction um, led him into uh, very serious poverty, you know, so just trying to maintain a relationship with him during that period, you know, he was sleeping with bed bugs and sleeping in tenements, and, and in the end, he, uh, he was left homeless and penniless, um, and I had to tell him, look, I can't help you, uh, you got to get sober. I, otherwise, I, you're just on your own. Probably the hardest thing I ever did. And um, I think he thought about suicide seriously, but um, he didn't. He went to a, um, a halfway house and then got involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. For him, Alcoholics Anonymous is church. This is where he has learned to believe that God does not give up on a drunk, that God is for him, that God will protect and to keep him. <clears throat> so John's the most religious guy in our family. He prays morning and night on his knees, asking God to help him be a per purpose, a person of service, to, to give, to maintain his serenity, his uh, composure, self-control. Um, he's now been sober for three years. So I'm very, very proud of him. John would say he is grateful to God. He said, you, you don't have to be proud of me. This is God, something God has done for me. Um, and he, um, but, be, you know, because of his experience, it's given me a really kind of insider view of poverty and near poverty. Um, he's now uh, in love with a woman. They're going to get married in September. And for more than a year now, he, he has a minimum wage job, and he's been taking care of his girlfriend and her little boy. Um, John doesn't feel like he's cut out for college, so a minimum wage job in this economy is about what he can earn. And taking care of three people on a minimum wage job is very, very tough. It is very, very tough. Um, in all that, you know, the main thing, John would say the main thing has been uh, AA and God, but I think the public programs, in fact, have been helpful. So uh, John's fiance, uh, for a period of time, she did get SNAP, she got Medicaid, uh, health insurance for the little boy who's going to become my grandson. Um, she's lived in Section 8 housing for a while. It was crap housing, but she got, um, I don't know, free or cheap housing. So she and, the, and this little boy are in much better shape now because they had public assistance for those first few years. John hasn't used uh, federal assistance, but I thank God that the state where he's living has a drug treatment court because uh, the drug treatment court was able to combine uh, discipline, the threat of jail, with an understanding that this is a disease in a way that no church could. You need the power of the state, you know, to say, you know, if you screw up, you're going to jail this weekend. Uh, and I think the drug treatment court, it, I mean, it's great public policy. It saved, when, the, when you put addicts in drug treatment court, you save money because you don't have to pay for them to eat three meals a day in jail. So, um, so I guess my, my own experience with my own son, uh, makes me really convinced that nobody gets out of poverty without working his butt off. I'm not trying to make things easy for people to get out of poverty. It's impossible. 
everybody who gets out of poverty works hard. But I think um, we can set up laws and systems that make it possible for people to climb out of poverty in our country and all over the world. And that w that's what Bread for the World is about. Thanks. I want to close with just one or two observations. One is this. Um, David, thank you. You have just given us an incredible amount to think about today, um, both this morning and this evening. This is your time in your lives, students, when you can explore these questions. Explore them in the classes that you choose to take. Explore them in the experiences that you intend to have while you're here. Seek out those places where you can address these kind of questions. These are the questions not only of David's in my time, but of your time. Um, and they're questions that you are going to have to address in order to live um, in peace and security and to have peace and security for others as well. And so the heart of what God's um, intentions for humanity really are. Um, so, this, so I just want to thank David for, for thank you for, for um, sharing that with us. Um, secondly, I just, want to, I just want to alert you to tomorrow morning's um, um, two uh, workshops. One of them is at 9.30, the first on emerging themes in local food movements, food sovereignty, security, and generosity. We're going to be looking early in the morning at local food um, development. Um, we're going to look at, at um, organic kinds of things. We're going to look at um, local production and local use. The second one is the Earth and God's Bounty, emerging themes in global food production and distribution, which we're going to look at the global sort of scale of food production, what is needed in the future. How do we bring this, um, how do we bring food supplies that are so desperately needed increasingly um, to our world that is hungry? Um, so we're going to look at both of those. Um, and I, I think both of them will be really challenging, will be informative, and will help the whole discussion that um, began earlier this week with, it, with another um, event uh, on Wednesday evening. So looking forward to that. Um, um, I think these are critical issues that face um, all of us. Um, and so we thank you for coming out tonight. Have a good evening. I hope we see you tomorrow morning.